good, doesn't he? Yeah. And I'm not talking about Dan. Yeah. Now you're good, Dan. You're good. But God is speaking something out to me. He is great and greatly to be praised. It's fun meeting with God, isn't it? It is an experience of half. Meet with people and have the presence of God, the Holy God, and His Holy Spirit be amongst us, directing our worship and drawing focus to us. <clears throat> We're continuing our journey through the story, and it's God's story. I want to remind you of that. So we are on chapter 18 of this book that has 31 chapters, and in its actuality, we are in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Some of you would say, well, we're about halfway through the story, but we're not halfway through the story. You don't want me to tell you. You're right. That's okay. We're not going to cover every little thing that happens in Scripture. That's for us to discover time and again throughout our own study and experience with God. But literally what we're doing is trying to gain a better understanding of God's ultimate story, his upper story, his purpose in this world. So we've been going through this story, our whole church journey through the story, uh, starting at the very beginning, 18 weeks ago, can you believe that? Talking about Adam and Eve in the garden and God's great creation and his great plan, and then chapter 3 comes along and the whole thing is screwed up. Right? <laughs> Adam and Eve brought sin into the picture. And from that time to this, this very day, God has worked and been at work in the lives of his people to restore the relationship and his plan, the way that he had designed everything to be. And we are his great passion. We need to understand that. Every single one of us, all of humanity, is God's great passion, and he will do anything and spare no cost to get us into relationship with him, a relationship that will last for the rest of eternity. Amen? He'll, he'll do anything. Throughout the story so far, we have seen that God has a plan, and that plan all along has been to show the surrounding nations who God is and to reveal to everyone God's big plan to get everyone back into relationship with this great God. And he's going to use the Israelites to do this. His chosen people. That was their job. To show the world who God is through their worship of this God, through their interaction with God, and through their interaction and life with each other, and with the rest of the world. That's our job as well. I hope you understand this job description has changed. It is our job to present the character and image of God to the rest of the world. Jesus summed it up in his great commission to us. Go into all the world, baptizing them. Baptizing all nations. Okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them what I have taught you, and then giving us that great, that great nugget of hope that in the difficulty of discipleship, in the difficulty of going and telling someone about a God that loves them and sharing a, a life of grace and love and mercy, Jesus says, I know that's really difficult, and most of you, it's going to be really uncomfortable to go and disciple, and I need you to know that I will be with you even to the end of the age. What better hope do we have that in the job that Jesus gave us, he will be with us. He's not the manager that sits there in the office and says, you're horrible at this job. We need to have a job for you. Okay? He, he doesn't do that. He's with us on the front line through the, the gift of his Holy Spirit. We've been seeing all through these 18 weeks that this was the job description of the Israelites, and we've been seeing that they failed to keep their part of the deal. They did not do their jobs well. 
Their job was to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love each other and others as themselves, and point people to God and his great plan. The good part about this, even though they were horrible at their job, is that God is faithful. He's not that manager who, at the first sign of a mistake, will just fire you. Fire God. You can't do your job. You get one chance, one chance only. God's not that kind of God. He says, I'll give you lots of chances. But as we've been also talking about, God chances, as much as we would say, they're not infinite. Okay? Eventually, if we keep on doing the wrong things, knowing what is ought to be done, God can't keep blessing a people who misrepresent him. So that nation of Israel is split in two. Those ten tribes lost forever because they wouldn't listen to the prophets and they wouldn't do what God asked them to. They would not be obedient. And God said to them, those ten tribes, I have given you every opportunity. I have given you uh, these prophets who shared the word with you and you haven't listened. And I have given you options and, and different kings and, and different things. And you still haven't listened. I've given you, uh, at that point, 208 years. But in actuality, from Genesis to Genesis, it's been long. And he says, you know, I don't need you for my upper story plan to be fulfilled. And that's a harsh way of looking at it. But God needs an obedient people. God is a God of structure and expectation of people. And so that those tribes were destroyed. Assyria came in, was the instrument of God's uh, discipline, and those tribes were gone. Then we were left with the southern kingdom, Judah, and Benjamin. And, and in all this, God says, I must keep Judah because the Messiah, my promise to Abraham and David, the Messiah will be through this house, so I must keep that. So he says, I'll keep you, Judah. Now, Judah had some good kings, five of them. They had some bad kings. And they end up ending with some bad kings and who are not obedient. And so the very next thing that has to happen is those kids need to be disciplined. But God says through Ezekiel and Jeremiah, we talked last week, God says, you're going to get some discipline. And Babylon's going to come in. You're going to be my instrument of discipline. And you're going to be put into exile. But there is hope. Because it will only be for a limited time, and I will bring you back. And if we remember last week, he said, so that all the nations will know that I am God. I will restore you, I will save you, I will rescue you, and everyone will know that I'm the one who has died. What we really begin to see now in chapter 18, the book of Daniel, is an example of how to live out God's plan in the lower story of our lives while in the midst of exile. So maybe a, a question for you. Do you feel like you're in exile? Anybody? Somebody says I was. Do you feel that in this country or in this time in the world that uh, Christians are persecuted? It happens. Exile is not necessarily a location, though. Exile is a time of, of discipline and, and being away from God and his blessing and, and covering his blessing. It can be self-imposed. We can put ourselves in the desert and step away from God and be in exile and say, well, nothing is going right in my life. Wish me happy birthday. I'm going to go eat some worms. <laughs> but exile too can be a discipline from God. I think in this uh, this current <coughs> culture that we're in, we're just living in the midst of exile. You know, that even though we're in a great country, uh, a prosperous country, and a country of opportunity for just about anybody. We are kind of in this exile. And I really believe that in Daniel, he gives us some great opportunities to see how to flourish in the midst 
of the time and people who are hurting you or oppressing you, how to, how to live out God's uh, plan and be obedient in the midst of all that. In, in the midst of uh, being surrounded by people who don't like you because of what you believe and what you worship. Being surrounded uh, by a group of people or, or a nation of people who don't like you because of what they think they know about your group of people. God calls us to flourish, even in the midst of exile. And so today we're going to just look at uh, three short stories and uh, some applications about how we can live well in the midst of exile. So the Babylonians take exiles to Babylon, starting at right in Daniel chapter 1. If you open up your Bible to your devices, uh, whether you have the Daniel chapter 1, we're going to go over just the first part of that chapter, and then we'll get into a couple more. Daniel chapter 1, starting at verse 1, and this is the, one of the fun parts of the Bible where we get to, again, go through lots of cool names, names that many of us can't pronounce, so we just kind of skip over them, or we say, Nebuchadnezzar, and that translates into Nebuchadnezzar. And we get into some fun times where names get changed, and then they have two names, and all those things. Uh, starting at Daniel chapter 1, uh, verse 1, it says this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of, Be of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These will be carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon, and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashkenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Okay? So one thing I want you to, to know about here is Babylon and Ashkenaz are an instrument of God's discipline. Okay? So they're, they're, they're just given the back. Okay? Uh, God allows them to just march right across the desert from what is modern day Iraq to Jerusalem, and uh, they come over all the way, and they just take Jerusalem, and they do not leave a stone upon another stone. The temple is destroyed, the wall is destroyed, the buildings are destroyed, and it's easy. It's allowed it because it's what God has in mind. Uh, going on in uh, verse 4. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every sign of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's house. It's safe to say that most of us are not qualified for this description. Okay? So it's pretty safe. Okay? Uh, he was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. Uh, they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. So we understand he's not just picking the slaves from Judah Benjamin, he's picking people from all over. And among those are some kids of God, okay? Some, some people from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief officials gave them new names. Don't you love that? What's your name? Ryan. Not anymore. <laughs> now we're going to call you Bob. Tell me Not Bob. That's not hard enough to say. <laughs> okay, so to Daniel, the name Belshazzar. I mean, you go from this easy name that you can write at the top of your page, Dan, or Daniel, to Belshazzar. It's a mouthful. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. So, Nebuchadnezzar wants the elite. He wants the bright or the smart. And he wants the young. The top four of this group are who we just said. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Right. So, as the official for the king, they <laughs> looked out over these people. He wants nobility. He wants some good looking young guys. But they haven't had other qualifications. They need to be smart, be able to learn languages, all 
Solomon's king, and out of all this group of people who think he's for God. The top four. So they're taken from Jerusalem. These guys are the cream of the crop. They are the best of the best. They are perceived as this. And Nebuchadnezzar wanted the elite, and what he got from Judah and Benjamin are these four guys. Okay? So these three stories we're going to look at today start with three of these guys. Three stories to show us how to live out God's plan for our lives. And I want to look at them today. The kids are in exile. God is going to show them and us that we can all live a holy life, even when we're surrounded by a culture that is, is anything but holy. So the first story is this. Daniel and his three friends refuse the Babylonian diet. And they offer a creative alternative. This is found in Daniel chapter 1, continuing from where we left off in verse 8. Okay, so follow along, and we'll see this creative alternative. Starting in verse 8, it says this, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile, defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and come back into Daniel, so the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guards, and the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please check your servants the same day. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and wine to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Okay, so they have a governing body above them. The governing body has dictated that they will eat food and wine. These elite, okay, this special group of guys who make it tiny, that they'll eat the food and wine off the table of the king. Daniel doesn't want to do that. He wants to stay devoted to God and have all allegiance, but he's respectful of the leadership that God has put them under. He doesn't riot. He doesn't rebel. He accepts. And he says, please, give us a time. Let us test. Ten things. That's all I ask. And then see. Okay. This is a, a good lesson to learn. So, he agrees them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Ananias, Mishael, and Azariah. So, they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Now, is it humanly possible that they could have been that much better? Sure. Could it also be that God was blessing them and those who were holding them captive? Possibly. If Daniel and these three guys, we'll call them Rats, Cats, and Benny. <laughs> if you've ever seen Benny's Cats, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's a lot faster and easier to say than Cats, Cats, and Benny. Okay. If, if they would be obedient, God would bless them. Even in exile, if they would do what God asked them to do, he'll bless them. And because of that, remember the promise that he gave Abraham. I mean, we're talking centuries ago. I will make your nation great. And those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. Okay? If, if Daniel and Rex and Benny, if they are nice and respectful and they bless old Nebuchadnezzar, 
And then he takes that and receives it and honors them. He's going to receive a blessing. Okay? So the Bible says a lot about the food we eat. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and we do need to care for them. Okay? Our diet is important, but it isn't just about the food that we consume. Good answer. I mean, there are those who take on the Daniel diet. Okay? The problem with the Daniel diet Eat nothing but vegetables for you have a big hole in your diet. No protein, no fruit. Okay. And your body needs that. Okay? So you lose a lot of weight eating those good vegetables, but you also lose muscle. Like you lose a lot of things. You lose health. Now this, we understand in our knowledge of this now that God's really blessed with you. Daniel, that second day. Okay. He's got his hand in it. But it's not just about food. What other diet does our culture offer? Or what other diet uh, changed us? What do you think? What, what comes to mind? Is this not about food? What other habit changes us? Maybe if you're in business and, you're, and your company uh, thought highly enough of you to give you a, a business credit card, and you would say, well, that's nice. And after a while, you know, the expenses are kind of taken care of, and, and they get used to your trading yeah. habits and everything, and, and then something comes up, and you say, well, I left the car, and the company didn't pay for it, so maybe I should just, I should just eat a little more. Maybe uh, I've got a bill that I've really got to take care of, and I don't have the money, so I'll just put it on there, you know. Uh, a diet of, of maybe handling some things in a way that we shouldn't. Maybe it's uh, gossip. A steady diet of gossip is one of the worst things that can happen to us. It's a sin, God says. But within the church, it's just as bad as without. We talk about people behind their backs. We talk about them badly. We talk about them as if they're uh, We talk about a lot of things that we just don't know that we assume. And before you know it, 100 other people assume the same thing. Maybe true, maybe not. A, a diet of gossip can do a lot of damage. And not just to our, our bodies, but to our conscience. Right? We must refuse to eat the world's diet of whatever it is. We do it respectfully. Right? Right. We say to God, God, what would you have? If it's forms of entertainment, if it's gossip, whatever it may be, if we take on the world's diet, the world takes us on. And we will find ourselves drifting ever more away from God and not being able to hear what he's asking us to do. So we stay away from the world's diet of whatever it is. And the lesson is that as we stand with God, we receive his blessings. And oftentimes it's just simple stuff. If we just stand with God, we'll receive his blessing. And then the people around us, they get blessed as well. The results for Daniel and his friends are this. Daniel and his three friends are healthier and ten times wiser than the people, other people training for this. And, and they are blessed by God. For Daniel, that means great things. He's an interpreter of dreams and visions. And boy, is, if you go past these stories or read now into the second half of the book of Daniel, you'll see some stuff. Revelation stuff. It's amazing what God trusts him with. Okay. So we can be in the world, but not of the world. We can serve other people and other beliefs and cultures while still remaining obedient to God. We can do it respectfully and submit to the authority that God places over us and still flourish. And receive God's blessing if we're obedient to Him. Uh, the second story we're going to look at—that was the first one. The second one we're going to look at is Daniel and his three friends refused to worship an idol of uh, Nebuchadnezzar and their throne into what? The fire. Okay. So Daniel chapter three. Daniel chapter three and his three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refused to bow down and worship this 
90 foot gold statue of Neptune. Okay? So Nebuchadnezzar built this gold statue 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. Apparently, he didn't understand scale. <laughs> because that would mean that Nebuchadnezzar was really skinny. And my guess is, as a king, he probably wasn't as skinny. But 90 feet high, 9 feet wide, gold. Okay? Not so much. And he assembles everyone. And he tells them whatever they hear, the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, all kinds of music, they are to fall down and worship the image of gold that he had made, this idol. So there are some guys in the kingdom who didn't like these Jewish statues of the Christ of God. And they certainly didn't like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they're interested in all the glory. They couldn't do anything wrong. They're being blessed by God. They're ten times smarter than everybody else. They are strapping young, good-looking guys. So they're the envy of all the other guys in service to the king. And you know, when you're at the top of the throne, you like it. And you might do things to try to pull you back down, right? No, they don't like them, so they set a trap for them, and they go to the king, and they tell old Nebi that these three guys are not bowing down at the appropriate time. We call those people today cattle tails. <laughs> right? Because when you just want to get somebody in trouble, it's not a safety thing, it's not a life and death thing. I don't know how many times my wife and I have said to our kids, is anyone weeping or dying? No? Okay, go away. Because <laughs> you're just trying to get somebody in trouble. That's not a right way of doing it. So these guys are tattletales. They just want to get Rackstack and Betty in trouble with the king so that there will be credit. Okay? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Betty, they trust in God and they defy the king's command. They submit to his authority and they're very respectful. Okay? They're doing everything uh, right except for when it comes to bowing down to idols. Can anybody remember where that comes from? I'm sorry? Ten commandments. Exodus chapter 20. Don't have any gods before me. Don't make idols. Don't worship them, right? The men just have to see the holy. That's the one God likes to drink, but so we're going to talk about it. So the men just have to see the holy. But we're not supposed to bow down to anybody but God. I'm just saying respect to, respectfully submit to authority over us. Uh, our legislature, our lawmakers, our government, okay? But when they start doing laws and things to have us break God's law, we can't. We just can't. Okay? This is important to God. And so they refuse to bow down. And this is what they say in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, and it is very powerful, okay? So they say this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God who we serve, the God we serve, is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But, and here's where I have it underlined and highlighted and and all of that in my, my Bible. Even if he does not, we want you to know, Your Majesty, that we will not serve your God or worship the image of gold you have set up. So he's strong enough right now by this means. I'll be ready to play a lot, even today. Okay? And, and, and Martin Lloyd was singing from her team. He, he placed this to his son's journey with um, crown, with onset diabetes. He will have this the rest of his life. When he was little, he got it. And Mark doesn't understand this. Why a child, an innocent child, would get a disease like diabetes and suffer through chronic illness, okay? And therefore, his parents suffer all through this. And so he says to himself, I know God can heal this. I know God is big enough that he can take diabetes, cancer, AIDS, whatever he wants to throw at him, and he can just wipe it away. And I would worship him because then that would be awesome. But even if he doesn't, 
still going to work. Are you still going to submit to his sovereignty and his authority? Because he is God and I am not. I don't have all the information. I don't know why. So I will just obey. And Rashad and Benny are saying the same thing. We know our God can deliver us from the fiery furnace. But even if he chooses not to, we will never bow down to your gold statue. We can't. chapter and story of this story in the Bible, or maybe you learned about it when you were a kid in Sunday school. You know what happens next. They're put in the fire furnace. And the reason I highlight and underline this verse is because these are some very brave men who are reminding us we have a God. If you remember uh, David as a little boy, growing up in front of an army, in, and he's looking around and nobody will answer Goliath's challenge. They have a whole army full of adult men, fighting age, ready to go. And Goliath walked out there every single day and he said, give me your back. No one knew. They shake in their boots. And David said, What are you doing? We have a God. Well, why won't you get up there and fight him? It doesn't make any sense, right? And if you remember what David said to Goliath, Good old David. The Psalm 1 reads, Where his armor is too big against the enemy. He says, Look behind my back. Look at my shepherd's arm. I got the slaves. I got the stones. Okay? And he walks right into Goliath and he says, I'm going to chop off your head. So that the whole world will know that Israel has God. You can come before me with that armor, that spear, that shield, and it don't make any difference. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego doing the same thing. You know, they, they could be that they very respectfully report to the other and say, we've done everything that we've ever asked them. But we won't go this time. We've been able to obey our God and still submit to your authority, but when you have us do this, it's too far. And we won't do it. So whatever you got, so it has, because we're not here. We have a God. God instructs us to work as if we are serving God himself because we are. So we have, if we have people above us that we struggle with in our workplace, we can rise above it and give our best because we're ultimately serving God. But when we ask to do something that violates our devotion to God, if we're asked to do something or laws are legislated that violate what God has asked us to do, we just can't do that. We stand up and we remain obedient. And we suffer the consequences. Because there will be consequences. But they will last that long. An eternity with God, when we do the right thing, and God says, well, that's my good and faithful servant. An eternity with God, knowing that I've been obedient, I've done what God has asked me to, that's way better than being thrown into a fire furnace. Old King Nebi, he's so mad at Rash Jack and Benny. He can't believe anybody would defy him. So he orders the furnace heated seven times hotter than normal. And he gets the strongest soldiers, the biggest guys he has, and he ties up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he has them thrown in. The fire is so hot that the soldiers who threw them in get burned up just by being close enough to throw them in. But to his surprise, old King Nebi, he, as he looks into that raging inferno, he doesn't see three people. And I would figure if my guys die on the spot, and they didn't even enter the furnace, well, there's nothing left for those guys. They're just instantly consumed. But as he looks in there, <coughs> there's not three, there's four people. This has a life. If I can send it off the, check it out, the boat. They're dancing around in there, they're having an awesome time. They went hard in there. You see four, so 
that the third one looked like the Son of the God. And, and we know that it's not the Son of the God, it is the Son of God. Jesus. Making his appearance in the Old Testament before he would ever be born. There he is. Proving once again that he will do whatever it takes. Jesus. That he will stand by us. From that great commission statement, I will be with you even to the end of the days. I will be with you in the fiery furnace before I'm even born. I'll be there. It's not a clue along the way in the word of God that the Son of God is going to get involved with humankind in a very powerful and incarnational way. In with us, on purpose, face to face, hand to hand. And it's our first glimpse of him as he is dancing and praising God as dad in the midst of the waiting inferno. So what happens? Well, old King Neb, he ends up doing something because of this. He ends up giving glory to the God of Israel. Glory to not his God, but the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego again. Now this is pretty important because he's a king. And he's not an Israelite king. He's the king of Babylon who has other gods. He gives glory to the God of Israel after Rashad and Betty come out of the furnace with not a single hair singed, all their clothes fully intact. Old King Nebuchadnezzar says, I praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants as he promotes them and decrees. He decrees as king that if anyone speaks ill of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be cut into pieces and their homes will be laid ruined to rubble. Okay? Now, the thing you need to know about decrees at this time is when a king makes a decree, there's a law. And it's irrevo irrevocable. Not even the king can change what he has said. Okay? So he makes this decree, this long standing, permanent decree that he, he himself can't go back on, that no one is to speak ill of God. And the punishment is severe if they do, cut to pieces. Okay? Whole house ruined. Okay. That's something. All because Rashad and Benny were obedient. All because they said, we will respect you, we will serve you, we will be the best. Ten times smarter than anybody else. We're the healthiest, we're the best looking. But when you tell us to do something that goes against what God is all, that's terrible, dear folks. It's integrity. And because of it, God blesses them and honors them and blesses and honors King Nebuchadnezzar. And now this decree. What else the hell do I do now, John Ben? You see, we stand in our faith for God even in the midst of overwhelming odds. Many times others will be pointed to God and they may just change their way. God will be praised whether we burn in the furnace or dance and sing for joy side by side with Jesus. It don't matter. We just need to be obedient. The final story, maybe one of the most famous from the book of Daniel, which is this, if I remember, is Daniel himself refusing to pray to the new king, the Persian king, uh, Darius, who conquered the Babylonians, and in, because of that, he's thrown into the pit of lions. So this is found in Daniel chapter 6, and Daniel is such a man, he is so recognized uh, it, with, because of his integrity, his character, his honesty, his trustworthiness, he has been elevated to basically second in command, right? And he's a slave, a Jewish slave. This should remind you of another story earlier on in the Old Testament. Who was so revered, so admired for his honesty, his integrity, how he handled things, uh, not once was he put in second command, but multiple times, and it led him all the way to being second command to Egypt, right? So this is very similar, very uh, a parallel here. When we are obedient to God and we do the best we can in exile, and we remain faithful to God, he will flourish us, he will bless us. 
So Daniel is this man of vigor and trustworthiness, and it's because he has been working for God, not for King Nebuchadnezzar. He's been subject to King Nebuchadnezzar, and he served King Nebuchadnezzar, but ultimately he served God. And everyone is amazed at Daniel and his service, so much so that when Persia ends up conquering Babylon, King Darius exalts Daniel even more and gives him a place of incredible authority. But the local power players, again, don't like him. He doesn't deserve to be there. He's not one of us. All the political intrigue, if you will. So Darius's officials are jealous of Daniel, and they plot to trap him by convincing Darius to make a decree. You remember the decree, right? If the king makes a decree, he can't go in. Darius makes the decree. I mean, he's, you know, you're invited to come out and say, man, you're such an awesome king. We should have a celebration for you. Everybody should bow down and praise you because you're awesome. I mean, what earthly human would stop that? I'm pretty bad. Who would want that? And if you're king and everybody has different decisions, okay, everybody's got to bow down and bow down. Yeah. Praise me. So he makes a decree, a revocable, a revocable. Not even really realizing what's going on. So Darius, if there's one thing you need to know about Darius, he loves Daniel. Like a like son. He loves Daniel. He trusts Daniel. He believes in Daniel. He has exalted Daniel up to second command. And he doesn't realize that this is all to get Daniel. So he makes the decree. And Daniel, as is his habit, that's his habit, he opens his window and he prays towards Jerusalem, prays to God three times a day, without fail. He talks with God. He meets with God. He has a great relationship with God, but he doesn't pray to Darius. He prays to God. Okay? So the officials, they know this. Why they did what they did. So they know that they have trapped Daniel, uh, but King Darius is also trapped. So he is forced to punish Daniel. Darius recognizes something special in Daniel. He, he doesn't want to kill him. And God's word says he tries to rescue him because he is so upset that his favorite guy has been caught disobeying a decree, a law. But he can't go against his own decree. So he has to give the order to have Daniel put in the lion's den. And he says to Daniel in chapter 6, verse 16, and here we go, another king making some very profound statements. He says to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, so this is a king understanding that he's just a little man. He knows who Daniel ultimately serves. He says, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Boy, if that was a prayer, what a powerful prayer. So here we have the whole king of Persia, a vast, huge empire, praying to the God of Israel, rescue this one man. I love him, and I'm stuck, and the only way it's going to happen is if you rescue him. So may you do it. So Daniel is spared. He gets thrown into that lion's den. And he spends the night with some pretty titties. <laughs> Soft titties. <laughs> but not like a girl. Did they ever fall asleep? Literally, folks. You know, we, we don't know what happened in their uh, kingdom. God knows. We do know that in the morning when they roll the stone back, there's Daniel. Still alive, he doesn't have scrap on. So I can only assume that he had a really good night's sleep with some furry titties keeping him warm. And he, you know, maybe he did some scratching in the chair behind the ears or whatever. But they had a great time. And, and he had to fear nothing about being thrown. He 
God like this. He's obedient. And again, it's one of those, I know God's going to get me out of here. He may never catch me. I'm going to remain obedient to him. And I'll be with him. So after the lion uh, went out by Samuel, the result was really quite amazing. I think even more amazing than the result from King Nebuchadnezzar. You see, all those political power players that had taught Daniel and done all this stuff, they're standing there waiting to see this body. Now, since the lions didn't eat that morning, they're still pretty hungry. <laughs> there he is. Once he realized that his prayer had happened, I said, too, God is protecting you, man. He took those advisors and their families and threw them all in, and they were ripped to shreds. That's just a, a sub part of it. The part that I, I love is in Daniel chapter 6, verses 25 to 27, says this, And King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, not just his own empire. He sent notification to every known nation, okay? He, he sends a new decree, and he says, uh, May you prosper greatly. I make the decree that in every part of my kingdom, People must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lion. Folks, this sounds like a, a religious leader from the tribes of Israel. But it's not. This, this guy has not studied the scriptures. He doesn't have the relationship with God that the Israelites do. He, he's got nothing other than his experience with Daniel. And that experience has changed him so greatly that he makes an irrevocable decree to all the world. May this great God be pleased. Folks, we have a God. A God who saved Daniel. A God who danced with Hananiah, Mishael, and, and Azariah. A God who taught these four guys how to live in the midst of exile, to do everything as if unto the Lord. And they did. And he honored it. And he blessed them. We have the same God. We serve the same God. And even if it feels like we're in the midst of exile, God is still speaking his lesson to us. Be obedient. Yes, you have earth. They don't have a dictator or somebody else. And, and those powers we are to submit to. We're to be taxed. We do all these things. We're to be good examples of peaceful people who bring forth the gospel of Jesus Christ in the midst of exile. We ought to respect the authority placed over us, but all the way to the point where it asks us to be disobedient to the God that is more potent and more powerful than that authority. The ultimate authority, the sovereign authority. Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they, they do a great job of showing us the opportunity to serve God in the midst of a culture that doesn't like them. In the midst of a culture that doesn't agree with them. In the midst of a culture that's trying they will not be changed. You can have faith in your God. God wants all of us, and He is hard at work in restoring us into a relationship with Him. These guys have a base stood firm. I mean, all around them, folks, they're not.
have to, and, and all around them he said, look to something else. And in the midst of all the garbage, we who really are in exile until Christ returns, we can stand firm because of, we have a God who will not give up until we are home with him. Right, you know, we can say that we're in exile in the United States, but there is a power in exile in this church, in this land, in this earth, because we're not home with God. And until that day happens, we're surviving. Surviving in a world. And folks, we can live the way that God wants us to. We can live in obedience. We can do all the things that God's asked us to do. We can be a, a holy and righteous people here on this earth. And when Jesus comes, I ask for more time. We'll no longer be in exile. There won't be wailing and pain and, and suffering and all those things. It'll be celebration. It'll be home. As we go into the world this week, we, we need to stand firm. I challenge you to do that. And to live courageously for God. So we can be respectful to other people while we serve the God who is over all. Our great God is ready to go into the furnace of God. And he is ready to close the mouths of lions for us. He will deal with our cranky employers for us. In the midst of uh, governments and all the political parties and all the stuff that's happening right now, God will still be with us and bring us back home. It's our job to honor and to glorify that God. To remain obedient and steadfast and faithful to Him. And to praise Him. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, we thank you for the lessons learned in your word from Daniel, Ananiah, Shael, Azariah. From the lessons learned from men like Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, who started out not even knowing who you were, but then made decrees, lawful decrees, honoring you. Thank you for the impact, God, you have on this world. And we pray today, God, that you would give us the courage to live a life like Daniel and these others. That in the midst of a world that is just seemingly against us at every turn, we would stand firm in the faith. That we would respectfully serve and honor and praise and remain steadfast and faithful to you midst of it all. As we go, God, we pray a blessing that you would put back into our feet and our hands, our hearts, our, our mouths, that we would be a reflection of Jesus Christ in this world, that you would be glorified in and through us, and that you would use us, God, as instruments of praise to bring glory to you. We pray this today, believing it, and we receive the blessing of your grace, breathing in. We will breathe out for